Uh, as I began looking at convention themes and uh, with the special place that 2 Corinthians 5 has in my heart, uh, it just seemed like a natural fit to ask Ed to come and share our keynote addresses with us uh, at our convention, looking at being reconciled to God, reconciled to one another, and reconcilers to the world. Uh, Pastor Kale, would you please come forward and share a prayer for our keynote speaker? Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for the reconciliation that we have received through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and all the amazing blessings that now come to us in this world that we can share that rec reconciliation with one another. We ask that above all, your name would be glorified in all things, and especially ask you to bless our speaker this day as he shares with us uh, the work of Ambassadors of rec Reconciliation and all the work that they do to bring us uh, together underneath of Christ's name. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. In the back of your binder under tab 8, you should find the seminar guide that I'm going to be referring to. And then also at your seat, when you arrived in convention, there should have also been this brochure proclaiming God's forgiveness. I will be using both of these throughout my presentation today and tomorrow. We heard this morning, from Pastor Noor, in terms of being reconciled to reconcile. But we have a whole lot more in common with each other. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. You know what that makes us? That makes us blood relatives. We are blood relatives to one another because of the reconciliation that cost our Lord and Savior his blood. And when we talk about being brothers and sisters in Christ, we truly are blood relatives. I have a number of things in common with you folks here in Nebraska. Even though I'm director of Cross Life Ministries over in Seymour, Indiana, and if you go to my bio on page 10 uh, under tab 1, you'll see that it referenced that I serve St. Paul's Lutheran Church at Jonesville. Well, I, save, I serve St. Paul's Lutheran Church at Jonesville as an interim pastor for 23 and a half years. <laughs> it wasn't that kind of congregation that needed so much reconciliation, okay? But I had the privilege giving them 10 to 12 hours a week because you see, as the Alban Institute writes, as some of our rural congregations need to survive, they need to connect with an established ministry. And that was true of St. Paul's Jonesville. What was unique about St. Paul's Jonesville, they would be a congregation that would fit right here in Nebraska. 80% of our congregation was tied up in agriculture. So all the ministry happened on Sunday. When I arrived at the church at 8 o'clock in the morning for Bible class to start at 9, worship at 10.15, meetings continued till 2 and 3 in the afternoon. And then the rest of my ministry there was a pastoral care ministry. And it was such a neat opportunity for 23 and a half years. I completed those responsibilities in January because we simply got too large. We became a 270-member congregation under God's blessings, and this July 1st, uh, yes, July 1st, we will be installing their first pastor in over 30 years, Pastor Matt Young. <laughs> but also, I grew up on a dairy farm in Frankenmuth, Michigan. 
And I know Cornhuskers and Wolverines don't exactly have the best relationship. <laughs> okay? But we're not going to get into that today. But there in that dairy farm in Michigan, my dad was the one who inherited the family farm. He had five brothers and sisters. My mom grew up a mile and one-tenth from where my dad grew up. And we're a German background. And so the grandparents lived in the house with my mom and dad. And then my other grandparents only lived a mile and a tenth away. So you know what that meant. If you screwed up as a child, all six of them needed to take a turn at you. <laughs> I have a long-standing history of reconciliation. <laughs> but it's also for you folks, this is your life. My wife comes from Chambers, Nebraska, 100 miles north of Grand Island, up by the Goose Lake Recreation Area. And so I meet this rancher's daughter, and I come with a dairyman background. One of our first issues of reconciliation in our marriage was, will I ever get fed? <laughs> because in the dairy, the dairy dictated your lifestyle. The morning, the noon, and the evening. You folks are ranchers. Many of you are. And you know what ranchers do? You know, they go out and they mow the hay. Well, then we got to go check the cattle. And we got to go check the pastures. And so lunch comes out about 3.30 in the afternoon. And as I'm getting into this family and I'm required to mow hay because my father-in-law knew I could drive a tractor. And it was also pay off the dowry. <laughs> <coughs> I was the only son-in-law for some reason who had to paint the house. There were six others, but they didn't have to paint. But for some reason, this preacher did. Well, anyway, you know, we get married. Well, this ranching background came into our marriage. And it'd be 7, 7.30 at night, and there was no hint of food. <laughs> None. We had to work out a structure about that. OK? Well, let's open your seminar, guys, because I want to show you some things that what we're going to take a look at today. And, and don't get the idea that we're going to get it to all six units. That's not going to happen today. What I'm giving you is a summary introduction to our new material entitled, Go and Be Reconciled, What Does This Mean? Because our reconciliation hand, happens under the cross. But what our ministry at Ambassadors of Reconciliation has done is we have developed a new Bible study entitled Go and Be Reconciled Using the Cross as Our Emphasis. And as the cross is our emphasis, as the writer to Corinthians says, we implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God that we'll find there on page two in our, in our guide. In our vertical relationship, God reconciled us to himself through Christ. We remember that we are children called to a lifestyle of reconciliation. And that begins in our vertical relationship with our God. And then it gets lived out in our horizontal relationship to one another that we are called to be reconciled, and we're called to be in relationship with one another and forgive as God has forgiven us through Jesus Christ. And so, as we look at this piece, Jesus himself said reconciliation was so significant that if you're coming to offer your gift at the altar and you remember that you have an issue with your brother, go and be reconciled before you offer your gift. Or if I could sim simplify that for all of you, here's what Jesus said. I don't want your false worship. I don't want all this pretending. I want it to be real. And that if you're going to worship me, it isn't just about you and me. It's also how you're living it out with one another. And so if you turn to page three in your summary guide, I want to give you the outline 
for our entire teaching. And on page three, you'll find there, in terms of being reconciled to God, and the theme verse that President Snow has used here within the convention, our first lesson is, remember whose you are. And we respond with, how does my identity affect reconciliation? And what we look at is the sacrament of holy baptism. And then in the second chapter, repent before God. How do my conflicts with others affect my relationship with God? We took at our life, we take a look at our life in relationship to the Ten Commandments. And then receiving God's forgiveness. How am I reconciled to God through confession and forgiveness, the office of the keys? But then we move into our personal relationship to one another. Confessing to the other person, how does my confession lead to reconciliation? And we take a look at the Apostles' Creed. Because we both confess our faith as well as confess our sin. And then forgive as God forgave you. What we pray about in terms of the Lord's Prayer. And then finally, restoring with gentleness. How does restoring others lead to reconciliation? And it's based on the Lord's Supper. So where I would like to begin this afternoon is to take a look at lesson number one on page four, remember whose you are, the sacrament of holy baptism. And here's what I'd like to do. I would like to read the question, and for the first question, the right side of the room gives us the answer. Then to the second question, the left side of the room, as I'm looking out, answers the question, and we'll alternate back and forth on the sacrament of holy baptism. And we begin. What benefits does baptism give? Which are these words and promises of God? What does such baptizing with water indicate? Where is this written? a big deal about baptism because you see because of the fall into sin our entire nature is screwed up we are sinners we are sinful creatures and what do sinners do they sin this is not a doctrine of our church but for those of us who do reconciliation, and you pastors know what I'm talking about, sometimes you just got to let people sin. Any of you parents? And how much counsel and wisdom you have given to your children? And then what do your children still do? They don't take your wisdom. They don't take your knowledge and they go do the very thing you didn't want them to do. That's how screwed up our nature is. And sometimes we just have to let people sin. And then we come along and pick up the pieces in reconciliation, and we're going to take a look at how that's done later on throughout this convention. We're a sinful creature. But scripture also gets very specific and says we're enemies of God. As it, Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if, we have, for if we, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. He literally calls us his enemies, caught in our sin, 
and spiritual depravity. And we're also people who ourselves struggle with sin. Think about the last time you were upset at somebody within your family circle and the thoughts you had. And nobody knows them. Think about the individual in your family that you just can't get along with. And the evil you wish on them. Because they just won't come around. That's how much we struggle with sin. And we're unclean. All our best efforts are described in Isaiah as filthy rags. And we end up literally being beggars before our God, not even worth coming into his presence, and yet we plead, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Take a fresh look at me. Because I am such a sinner. And left to our own, we are left condemned. But who are we in Christ? God coming to us. We're in Christ, then we're a new creature. We're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. The dividing wall of hostility has been removed because of Christ. And we're changed from an enemy to an heir. In holy baptism, we get the whole package. We get the forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, eternal salvation. And we don't even know it. But our parents do. And as parents, they brought us to that baptismal font. And we become a precious child of God. Precious, cleansed, and ransomed, and no longer separated from our God. Tyler came into my office. I hadn't seen Tyler in over nine years. Tyler was never a client of mine. As director of Cross Life Ministries, one of the things when we established Ambassadors of Reconciliation in 2004, we wanted to make sure that there was always a counseling component because we're going to work with churches and church workers and church professionals. And when Ted Cover, myself, and Bruce Stagel established Ambassadors of Reconciliation out of Peacemaker Ministries back in 2004, we were the first reconciliation ministry denominationally that was birthed out of Peacemaker Ministries. We thought in Peacemaker Ministries, being a reformed ministry, we could only go so far in terms of our clear doctrinal position and teaching regarding our use of the means of grace, the sacraments in God's work. And so in 2004, Ambassadors of Reconciliation was birthed, and I moved from Lutheran Child and Family Services of Indiana into Cross Life Ministries. I live in Seymour, Indiana. Seymour is a community of about 16,000. And on a daily basis, I'll do between six and seven appointments in a, any week if I'm just in the office, not out speaking in front of district conventions or teaching and training and reconciliation. I'll do about 30 hours, 28 to 30 hours of appointments. I've established myself being in the community since 1983 that up to one-fourth of my caseload any given week are church professionals across all denominational lines, either the church professional a spouse of the church professional, or a family member. It's very seldom that I have a walk-in in in my office. On this day, Tyler came walking in. I've known Tyler. He was married. He has three children. Watched his children come to our grade school at Emanuel Lutheran School in Seymour, supported by four congregations. And I also knew Tyler to be an aggressive individual. When his kids were in junior high, as a dad, he wanted them to succeed. But also, he became a little bit belligerent. And when his wife tried to intervene, they would get into some conflicts and fights. Well, one day, when Tyler's son 
was a junior in high school. The conflict between Tyler and his son got so strong that he hit his son. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That's when Tyler's wife proceeded with divorcing Tyler. The family was so estranged. Tyler moved into another state, into a large metropolitan area. When his children got older, his oldest daughter got married, she would not let her dad walk her down the aisle. So strained was the relationship. When his son got married, Tyler was welcomed at the wedding, but kept at a distance. This was the story that Tyler told me in our first appointment. How would you have responded to Tyler, having received this kind of information? You who are reconciled in Christ, you who have the waters of holy baptism, how would you have responded to Tyler? In my previous life as a counselor before reconciliation, my answer to Tyler would have been something like this. Wow, Tyler, you've really gone through a lot of life. And you've got a lot of hurts and burdens within your family. Where would you like to start? Which one of your children would be the easiest one to start with? When I was trained as a reconciler back in 1997, it completely transformed my entire ministry and also my ministry of counseling. Here's how reconciliation changed me as a pastor and as a counselor. I got up from my chair sitting across from Tyler and I walked over to him. Now, I'm 6'3". Tyler wasn't exactly a small man either. However, you don't stand over an individual. I came to Tyler and I knelt down right in front of him. And I said, Tyler, I know your parents. And I made the sign of the cross on his forehead and on his heart. And I said, Tyler, when you were just a young baby, your parents brought you to the baptismal font. And your pastor marked you with the sign of the cross on your forehead and on your heart as a sign and symbol that you've been redeemed by Christ the crucified. Your sins are forgiven you because of Christ. Tyler could not contain his tears. Tyler could not keep his compassion and wept and wept and wept and said, Pastor Ed, what have I done? How many of us here find ourselves on the treadmill of life. There's that individual that we want to impress in our life. There's that individual who we want to get our attention. Is it a mom? Is it a dad? Is it a brother? Is it a sister? Who is it that we want them to get to notice us? Or how many of us are caught up that we have to keep up with everybody else and wear just the right clothes, have the right looking car, have the right strain of bloodline in our cattle, wear the right Stetson hat. How many of us are caught up in the brand name, the brand shoes, the designer clothes, and we wear so many brand names that we can't even remember our own name? And how about us pastors? I get to work in a number of districts. And I get to see at times how pastors don't attend circuit meetings. And I think there's a reason for that. As you know, I served St. Paul's Jonesville for 23 and a half years. And there was a question that always got asked at pastors' conferences that I just shuddered at. It was the question that I just wished never would be asked. 
because I'm in this little country church, right around 200 members, farmers by trade, no real big evangelism efforts except the local oak tree. And the question goes, well, now we're at the casuistry time in our conference. How about if we go around and share what's going on in our congregations? I'm going, oh my gosh. And the big church in town would say, we just added 200 members this last month. Another pastor would say, I've got nine in adult instruction class. Another pastor would say, we're getting ready to do a building program. And here I am. I'm in conflict with my head elder because he wants to divorce his wife. And you're the pastor sitting there going, I can't share that my associate's having an affair and with, a wife, with a woman in our congregation. What would the guys think? And so we pastors are tempted to stay away from circuit meetings because we pretend so much. And we pretend how much better life is going than what it really is. My worth, your worth, is not measured by who you know or who you impress. My worth, your worth, is not measured by my own being or works or who I'm getting along with or what kind of growth is going on in the congregation or who I'm, a, who I'm in relationship with. Neither is my value defined by what others think. My worth and my value is determined by the blood of my Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who claimed us in the washing of the waters of holy baptism. And yet in conflict, here's what we oftentimes do. In our conflict with others, our identity in Christ makes a difference in how we treat one another. Others with whom we're in conflict with may call us names behind our backs, might start rumors about us. They may even exaggerate our wrongs and our weaknesses, and some of what they say may even be true. But that's not what defines our worth. Our worth is defined by the blood of the Lamb who shed it for you and for me. And likewise, I might think a little poorly of my opponent. And I just might do some of the same things. I'll talk about my opponent behind his back. I might even get on Facebook and post something in social media. But because of whose we are and who, what we look like and whose we are in terms of our baptism, we look at our adversary in a new light. We look at him as one who is redeemed by Christ the crucified. Because in baptism, I have my comfort. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's God walking with you every day. <coughs> it's a new identity. I'm a new creature. In baptism, I get to live for Christ. Not for what others think or gaining others' opinion. I'm in the newness of Christ. We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too can walk in this newness of life. And I get to put off the old self and put on the new. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and true holiness. Here is our challenge. 
How can I remember my baptism when I'm in disagreement with someone? I want you to go to the back page of your seminar guide. And here's a little exercise I want you to do. I want you to think of a current or past conflict with someone that comes to mind. And on that black back blank page, I want you to write down your first name. Would you do that, please, right now? <coughs> Just write down your first name. Then behind your name, write your identity. Child of God. Now, below your name, write the first name of someone you are currently in conflict with. Write down their first name. Behind that name, write this. For whom Christ also has died. for whom Christ also has died. Now, I'd like, you, I'd like you to take a few moments and write a prayer asking for God's help for you to view yourself and the other person as God views both of you. I'd like you to do that for the next few minutes. Write a prayer asking God to help you in reconciling your relationship with that individual. And ask him to help you view each of you as he looks at each of you. Ask for his grace in reaching out to the other person and pray for a blessing for that other person. I'm going to interrupt your prayer time and introduce to you a resource that is out on our book table in, in the room across the hallway. It's a devotional booklet entitled Forgiven to Forgive. It's set up in a similar way as Portal to Prayer. There's a scripture reading, there's a verse, there's a message, and then there's a short prayer. It's 42 devotions, 42 devotions on topics regarding reconciliation. I would like to read for you in my cl closing a prayer that I just ask you to write. It's a prayer entitled For Reconciling with Someone. Let us pray. I praise you, O God, for reconciling me to you while I was still a sinner. Help me to reconcile with the individual I'm in conflict with. Through your word, teach me to examine my own heart that I may be convicted of my sin. Lead me to confess to you and to those I have hurt. Guide me to gently restore the other person. 
Send your Holy Spirit into both of our hearts that we may be reconciled in our relationship with you and with one another. May our restored relationship be a living witness of your gift of reconciliation. I pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Nebraska District Convention, remember whose you are.